Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and go ahead and get started here. All right. Good morning. Today is uh, June twenty fourth, twenty twenty two. Welcome to the Metroplan Orlando Tismo meeting. I will call the meeting to order. My name is Ramon Senarins, and I will be chairing the meeting today. We also have a team of folks working to ensure this meeting runs smoothly. Just as a reminder, since this meeting and our future meetings will be in person, it is important for all TISMA members to attend our meetings in person in order for us to have a quorum. Members of the public will still be able to participate virtually, and we encourage them to do so. There are two public comments points in the meeting. Members of the public who want to speak need to fill out a comment card and give it to Lisa. Those attending virtually who want to speak will use the raise hands feature on the Zoom screen. If you're attending by phone, you can hit star nine to raise your hand and request to be recognized. When you're called, your microphone will be temporarily unmuted by staff and will ask you to state your name and contact information for the record. We also accepted comments by email and phone message before the meeting. So at uh, this time, I'd like to recognize Eric Hill of Metroplan Orlando staff for agenda review. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members uh, live, uh, as well as those uh, beaming in. Uh, good to see you all this Friday morning. I do have a few announcements um, to the agenda, Mr. Chairman, under the combined presentations. Uh, you did receive uh, e uh, an agenda earlier uh, indicating that we were going to have a bright line presentation. Well, that one's not going to be under the combined presentation for the TAC meeting. It's been replaced with a presentation by Ms. Lorraine Bobo, who's with uh, FDOT on uh, speed and safety. Uh, that's going to be the presentation that's going to replace the bright line presentation. And also, uh, Mark Tribitz from FDOT will be giving the truck parking pd and &E, uh, presentation rather than Steve Bush. Buck, excuse me. Also, uh, we had our annual TIP meeting last Tuesday, uh, excuse me, last Monday on the 19th, and it went very well. And the, we did have a comment from one of the participants that I think has uh, some relevance to this committee, and that's on audio pedestrian signals. And I know that the Traffic Engineering Manual does require new mass laws to consider uh, these types of devices at intersections. Uh, so if we could, and we'll do some follow-up with each of the members on uh, who's responsible for either responding to citizen interest in these types of devices or how to respond to any inquiries that we get. Um, and then uh, a few uh, internal uh, news. Uh, some of you already know that Mr. Nick Lepp has uh, resigned from Metro Plan Orlando. Uh, and Alex Trager has taken his position as Director of Transportation Planning. Um, and we also have recently promoted Ms. Taylor Laurent into the position of Transportation Manager. So she is taking uh, Alex's position. Um, and then lastly, uh, on a very sad note to me, uh, Ms. Laura Bauck is also resigning to take a position with the, the great city of Tampa. And I say it's a great city because that's where I live. Um, but Laura is sitting in the back there. Uh, many of you have worked with her, and she has been a great asset to Metroplan Orlando. Uh, I really enjoyed working with her, and I'm sure all of you have enjoyed working with her as well. And I do wish her all the best. So, Mr. Chairman, um, I think that's enough for me to say this morning. And uh, we can proceed. <coughs> okay, thank you, and uh, appreciate those that um, for your uh, time here at uh, Metro Plan and helping out. Um, your assistance has been greatly appreciated, and we uh, congratulate those who are moving on. So, all right, so now <coughs> move on to roll call. Yes, good morning. I'll ask all committee members to please keep your microphones off until your name is called. Please say here or present. Atkins? Present. Blackadar? Present. Broad? Present. Brown? Carson? Here. Bates? 
Edie, yeah. El Hassar, Brock for a Fathel Bab. Here. Olor for Jovanazzo. Here. Reyes Albino for Herschelman. Here. Home Poole for Homiani. Present. Jameson. Here. Dredge. Here. Kane. Here. Hudson. Here. Rumor. Here. Lim. Here. Margraf. McDaniel. Muhyson. Present. Pulliam. Here. Richmond. Sanders. Here. Schmidt. Sonorans. Here. Smith. Present. Wetzel. Here. Mr. Chair, that concludes the roll call and we do have a quorum. Fantastic. Thank you, Lisa. All right, moving on to uh, public comments and action items. We will now hear public comments. We ask that you provide your name and address for the record. And please hold your comments to two minutes or less. If any members of the public wish to comment and are joining us virtually, please use the uh, raise hand function, you'll be recognized, or dial star nine on your phone keypad, and you will be recognized. We'll send you a prompt to unmute your mic. Do we have anyone joining us virtually that would like to make a comment at this time? There are no hands raised on the virtual side, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Kathy. Do we have anyone attending publicly, publicly attending in person, wants to make a public comment? I have not received any speaker requests. All right, thank you. All right, so moving on to action items. We have three this morning. Members making or seconding a, a motion, please uh, state your name uh, prior to doing so. So the first uh, approval is for the uh, approval of the May 20th TISMO meeting minutes. <clears throat> you will find uh, that information in uh, tab one. Do I have a motion to approve the uh, minutes from the May 20th TISMO meeting? Um, this is Shad Smith. Um, I, um, I move to approve, but there is a, a typo in the middle of um, section VA, about right in the middle of the paragraph. It looks like, I don't know, some word was missing or something. So just that correction of that typo. So, but I move to approve other than that or with that correction. All right, I got a motion for the uh, approval with the uh, change that you stated. Do I have a second? Second, block it up. All right, I got a motion and a second. Any discussion? I have one additional correction. Sure, go ahead. Uh, item 5C, I might have said it backwards, but the bundle project was listed as Central County. It is City of Castleberry, so if we could correct that for the record. It, I think it has since been corrected in, in the documents, but I just wanted to clarify. That's toward the end of that section in 5C. In 5C, you said? Okay. All right. You want to amend your yes, motion? Yes, well, I'll. The... Um, yes, I will amend the, the motion with the correction as noted by Mr. Brock. All right. Got a motion? Second again, Blackadar. Second by Mr. Blackadar. All right. Any further discussion? Is the voice vote? All favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Second item we have is the uh, fiscal year 22-23 to 26-27 TIP. And you'll find additional information in tab two of your agendas. And we have Mr. Keith Kasky who will present the information. Uh, please hold your questions on this item until the presentation is finished. Please uh, go ahead, Mr. Kasky. Okay, well, good morning. Uh, last month I gave you all a preview of the new TIP and uh, there's a link to the draft TIP on your agenda and then some additional uh, information in uh, tab two. And uh, we had our virtual uh, TIP public meeting this past Monday and had pretty good attendance. This slide shows a comparison of the attendance this year with last year. And last year we had total attendance of 105, this year total of 88, so not quite as many. But there are about 120 people that registered for the meeting, so we anticipate that a lot of them will be 
uh, watching the video of the meeting or, you know, a lot of them have already done so. And uh, so we were generally pretty pleased with the turnout. And there were a good number of uh, questions and uh, comments that came up at the meeting. Um, and I've, you know, on various topics, and I've listed some of the main topics on the slide there. Uh, at the top is a comment that we seem to get almost every year about the need to shift more funding away from major capacity highway projects to improve the transit system and bike and ped safety and so on. And then there was a comment about the need for links to improve their convenience of their bus system and have more bus service at night. Uh, one person commented about uh, they'd like to see the Bright Line and Amtrak systems linked to provide a seamless high-speed rail system in this area and throughout the state. And then, uh, as Eric mentioned earlier, there was some questions and discussion about the uh, need for more audible pedestrian signals for the visually impaired and uh, how the um, safety programs are helping to address that issue. And um, so we'll be sending a summary of those comments out to, uh, separately to this committee and the other committees. And uh, we had a couple of polling questions during the meeting. Uh, the first one was related to the major increase in gas prices over the last few months. And it asked people, you know, how they had changed their uh, travel behavior as a result of that. And the majority of people did say that they are driving less and taking fewer trips. And then quite a few uh, also said that they're trying to work from home more. So that uh, seems to be a, a trend. And then uh, the other polling question was just a trivia question. You know, when did the first electric car debut in the United States? And the correct answer was 1890, although the majority of the people responding thought it was either 1910 or 1930. And um, we had um, a group of panelists from our local jurisdictions and agencies, many of whom are here today, uh, that helped us answer questions during the meeting, which was very helpful. And uh, we really appreciate uh, their participation. And the TIP will be going to the board for final approval at their meeting on July 27th. So with that, uh, unless there's any questions, uh, we're asking for your approval of the new TIP. Any questions uh, for Keith? All right. <clears throat> so uh, this is a motion to approve the TIP. You want to make a motion? Motion to approve, pass it on star. Got a motion. I'll second it, Chad Smith. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All right, this is a voice vote. All committee members online, please unmute your microphones. <clears throat> All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Thank you, Keith. Our third action item is the uh, fiscal year 27-28 through 34-35 uh, PPL. You'll find uh, further information in tab three <coughs> of the agendas. Uh, we have a presentation by Mr. Alex Trager from Metropolitan Orlando. And uh, once again, please hold your uh, questions uh, to the end of the presentation. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And uh, similar to Keith, like last month, this is, is a follow-up to a preview presentation uh, that was provided at your last meeting. As a little bit of background, um, again, this is a recurring process. We bring the tip. We bring our priority list to you every year. We bring our 2045, our metropolitan plan, to you every five years. Uh, and again, the prioritized project list helps us bridge that gap, focus on the first 10 of the long of our 2045 plan. All those other projects still remain cost feasible. This is really just a good an emphasis on that first 10 so we can focus on implementing those projects in a timely manner. And again, a focus on federal and state funded projects only. Again, as we develop the prioritized project list, it's about funding eligibility, first and foremost, and cost feasibility with our long range plan. We go out to 2045. Again, the tip is the first five years. The PPL is years really six through 15. And then our long range plan still has cost feasibility out to 2045. But important to note for as we develop our priority list and as it goes into the transportation improvement program are those last two items, funding availability and project readiness. We're working to fund project high priority, high priorities, following through with the projects that we've already begun as we bring new projects into the work program at the same time. 
So last, last month we made presentations and we've had some discussions with agency partners um, along the way. Since then, um, we have received some project status and funding updates. I'll talk about more of that specifically to the sp um, particular project lists. But this group, as well as our technical advisory committee, raised good questions about the prioritization process, how we allocate and distribute funds, and we'll also raise some good questions about the I-4 ultimate, or rather the I-4 beyond the ultimate project value engineering, how those projects are represented in our documentation. So we, we heard those. You've obviously received um, some, some response from, from Gary uh, relating to the timeliness of our adoption to of the TIP and of the priority list. Um, so I see a path forward in, in response to these questions as we move forward in starting to address some of the other programs that we had already in the PPL. There's four of those programs, safety emphasis, uh, side, critical sidewalk gaps, ACES demonstration, as well as uh, the countywide area-wide um, ITS projects. Again, we were planning on having discussions in the, the fall timeframe, August, September of this year, to start framing those out more closely with you, understanding how we want to you know, develop methods, you know, uh, call for projects, things of that nature. Um, but I think it's important based on the feedback that we've received before we kind of initiate that process, to kind of start talking about new programs and priority lists, um, that, that we start first and foremost with our existing processes. So that's my path forward to you in this new role, that I think we have an opportunity over the next year to you know, open, open up our methods, make sure that you as technical advisors are, are comfortable with our approaches. You know, our board has given us that direction you know, to kind of follow through with this approach. But I think, again, you know, as, as stakeholders in this process, I want to make sure that you're comfortable with how we do business. So that's my uh, offer extension to you, and I think it fits really nicely with what we are already planning on doing later this year in preparation for the next PPL. So with that, I'm just going to cover a couple of the stay high, a uh, couple of the priority lists. Talk about really what's changed. Nothing here on the state highway system list has changed. Just want to call attention that we really have some high impact projects really across the region, county areas, and in, in municipalities as well. So really good projects. A blend of some of those widening projects that have been on our books for some time now. We're also seeing those complete streets, context sensitive improvements being implemented on the state highway system as well. As it relates to our complete streets, our federally funded uh, complete streets program off the state highway system, you're also going to see projects funded um, across the region, some construction, but also bringing new projects for uh, project development, those concept studies engineering into, um, into the work program as we load that next fifth year next year. Again, more specific to this group, these are the priority phases that are being recommended for the next transportation improvement program. A lot of uh, preliminary, en preliminary engineering and some construction in the downtown area. And the only change, um, really two changes what from last month. One is one a little more recent than the, the, the first, but if you recall last month, we had the E. Williamson path that, that on our federally funded list, it was being recommended for uh, preliminary engineering. That project's actually being locally funded, so we're removing that project from our federally funded list. That project was placed onto our locally, you know, our local list for purposes of, of, of funding responsibility. Um, and in a similar fashion, um, this project here, the East-West Trail Connector, the downtown connector, uh, basically the Anderson uh, shared use path that's under construction, that project was also on our books. The city has advanced that uh, with, with um, locally, so that project is also being removed um, from our PPL um, based on consistency um, with how it's being funded, but also consistency with our plan. There's another project that the city of Orlando has, the downtown gap, which we'll be uh, working into our, our plans in, in the coming um, amendment cycles. Um, but with the E. E. Williamson Trail, with that project um, being localized, it actually um, um, provided the opportunity for the preliminary engineering for the Shingle Creek Trail, the Yates Connector from Pleasant Hill to Toho, to actually um, become part of um, our next recommendation for the work program. So more Shingle Creek getting in there for preliminary engineering. So with that, not really the only changes from last to this month, we're on that um, pedestrian and bicycle, um, our active transportation list, and really changes really focused because our local partners, you, 
are, are opting to fund these priorities, which is, a, which is a great thing, seeing them through. So with that, I, I, I mentioned the path forward, but I am asking you for your recommendation of approval today of the uh, PPL. With the one change, um, that, that uh, downtown connector, the east-west connector be removed. So that is in documentation that was brought up at CAC. So if we can include that in, in your motion, that would be helpful as we iterate to the next cycle, uh, to next committees. So thank you. Thank you, Alex. <clears throat> Anyone have any questions for Alex? Mr. Chairman. Oh, Bill, you're recognized. Uh, thank you. Alex, what criteria is used to move a project from the PPL to the TIP or otherwise besides the funding mechanism? It all starts in our long range plan, our 2045 plan. That's where cost feasibility is determined. That's where we, based on the scenario planning, the long range planning process, we identify needs, projects, and that's when we're overlaying long range forecasts of revenues. So that's a federally required process. And that, in that federally required process forces us to put projects in five-year bands. So we have our, our TIP, our first five years, our plan period one, the next five, 26 through 30, and the second five years, um, which is you know, um, 36 through 35, 34 through 35, rather. And then the last band is um, a 10-year band, cost feasible. The TIP, again, is the first five. The PPL is the first two plan periods, the first um, two periods of uh, the, the, um, the long range plan, but how, to, how that moves up, cost feasibility drives that a lot. You know, we, we did an amendment um, based on rising costs, you know, about four months ago. Um, so that's a driver, you know, cost of projects, our revenues are a driver. Beside those two points, how projects um, ranks will change is the criteria themselves. And, and based on the criteria and the weighting that the board has uh, agreed upon, especially for this cycle, it's a, a focus on safety and accessibility. So projects that are high uh, access impact and projects that are experiencing uh, critical safety and especially vulnerable user impacts are, are going to see kind of percolate, kind of rise to the top. Um, but other than that, revenue drives some of it because a lot of that preliminary decision making was done as part of our long range planning process. Thank you. Are there any projects that ultimately get off the PPIP or get abandoned? Yeah, absolutely. So again, it's kind of that that probably from long range plan to PPL, which is that bridge to implementation. So once a project is, a, or even a phase of a project, and there's a handful of examples of projects that are, you know, partially funded. You know, the PD&E is in the tip, but the first phase that you'll see in the PPL is construction because. You know, we finish what we start, and that's really what the PPL is intended to be, is that bridge, making sure nothing kind of gets lost along the way as we're implementing a 25-year vision plan. Um, so the only way a project really comes off the list is obviously if you fund it, so it's, you know, localized. Um, if you want to remove the project based on it no longer being a need, a priority, and that's a discussion that we can have, you know, with you and our board members as, you know, situations arise. Um, or a project is implemented through the federal or state funding process. And again, that's kind of us chipping away at project phases and then implementing projects, making them operational. And then again, like you're seeing, constructing and then bringing new projects into the work program. Thank you. Kelly, do you have a question? Oh. <laughs> okay. I will try to say it correctly this time. <laughs> so, so on the. Oh, I want to. Sorry, I want to. So, before you say that, I will be clear. One other change that we did, because I know where you're going. Uh, one other change that we did make, and I apologize for not calling this to uh, attention. We did receive a lot of comments about jurisdiction, implementing yeah. agency, kind of who's on, who's on first, who's in charge, and we were trying to get ahead of that with the PPL. But what we've decided to do is, as part of our pro project application process with. The tip is where we're actually going to be identifying implementing agency. For purposes of the PPL, we're identifying impacted jurisdictions. So that's basically the municipality or multiple municipalities and county that are located within the project or transected by the project. So I appreciate that, Alex, but it's still wrong. It oh, says, is it? It says Castleberry and Orange County should be Seminole County. So. Fit, what, what the, <laughs> is that the Winter Park Drive? The, yeah, the, the number one complete street. I'll take care of that. Um, also, 
related to that, um, I, could you go back a couple slides where you told me you, you were anticipating the next ones to be programmed, maybe the one before that? So, uh, uh, okay. I, so do you anticipate that project potentially being in the next cycle of the work program programmed in the next fifth year, or have you not gotten that far? Because I know it's a... This is what we're recommending, and this okay. is the priorities that DOT, that we and DOT use for the next work program cycle. So yes, absent some type of funding shortfall or you know other kind of economic circumstance, these are the priorities that we're recommending forward. Any further questions, discussion? All right, looking for a motion to approve the 27 to 35 uh, PPL, along with the uh, removal of the downtown connector. Do we have a motion? So move, Nabil Mahajan. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? I'll second to Shad Smith. Second by Shad Smith. All right, we got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? This is a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. All right, moving on to the uh, presentations and status reports. We do have one presentation today, and uh, as mentioned earlier, we'll hold all questions until the presentation uh, is completed. We have a presentation on the City of Altamont Springs Autonomous Vehicle Shuttle Pilot Program, um, presented by Mr. Brett Blackadar and provide an alternate multimodal parallel local transit corridor to State Road uh, 436. So please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Speak today. Brett, <clears throat> Brett, you turn on your mic. Hey. Is that better? <laughs> That's better. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to start today with uh, to talk about a book that I recently read um, called Think Again by Adam Grant. He's a professor at the Wharton School um, in Penn, and uh, excellent book I recommend. And uh, in the book, he, he references this graphic on the right, and he says that at some point you have the willingness to opine on a topic versus the knowledge of that topic. And if you get to the point where you have a little bit of knowledge on a topic, you get to a point where you're willing to talk about it, but you really don't know as much as you think you know, and you don't know what you don't know, so he calls that Mount Stupid. So today, as I talk about autonomous vehicle technology, I think I'm standing on Mount Stupid um, because there's so much I still don't know. And um, so I ask forgiveness from the beginning here today. Um, luckily for this project, I've had great feedback from people like Doug Jamison, Eric Hill, uh, Jeremy Dilmore's team. We have uh, Ryan Feshko here from VHB, who's on uh, our consultant team. Bruce Doig, who's now at the city, was also a consultant. So, um, there's a lot I don't know about this, but if you guys have any questions, hopefully I can, I can get someone smarter than me to do that. Um, so I'll start basic a little bit. You know, why, why autonomous vehicle technology, uh, autonomous vehicle shows begin with? So take a quick tour here of, you know, some of the, the common ways that we get around here, right? So the advantages of the automobile, right? Convenience, instant availability, but the disadvantages of it are high cost of ownership. These numbers here, 92.82 per year and 65 cents per mile are old now. Those were two years ago from AAA, so I'll be curious to see what they update, but it's probably over $10,000 a year now to own your personal car. Um, for me personally, I, have, I own three cars. Uh, only one of them is in Orlando, Central Florida now. One's in Tampa, University of South Florida. One's at University of North Florida, so my wife and I are sharing a car. She works from home, uh, so we're not excited about buying that fourth car and paying all that money, so uh, it does make your decisions um, you know, to the cost of ownership. The second thing is, is ride share, Uber and Lyft. Well, certainly it's convenient. Um, you don't have to worry about much, much parking, but it's very expensive. Uh, they're about one to $2 per mile, and the minimum Uber, Uber X is six fifty, so it can be a very expensive alternative. Uh, but it does have advantages for those that are mobility challenged, uh, certainly special events, so it has its place. Uh, but then we look at mass transit, like SunRail or Lynx, uh, much less expensive, certainly less stressful. I took SunRail this morning. Uh, several of us here were on the train and, you know, had a good time talking and catching up on stuff. Uh, but you have limited headways. It's less convenient in some situations. You can have limited off-peak service, but it equates to about 0.9 to 29 cents per mile uh, based on some research, which is much less expensive than, than driving. So is there a place for autonomous vehicle shuttles? Well, 
If there's no driver in the future, that could greatly reduce the cost. They could be more convenient. They're smaller and could serve areas that supplement existing transit systems, and they could have lower headways. The disadvantages, technology is de very much still emerging. Uh, we're not sure if they can, can, can do what we want them to do yet, and certainly they're currently operating at very low speeds due to some, some approval. So they very much could become a cost competitive alternative to the single occupancy vehicle and could supplement the transit system. So the other thing is that, uh, you know, why is it worth studying? This poll of the different generations uh, looked at baby boomers versus Gen X. So for, for Gen Xers like me, 34% said, you know, that having transportation or owning a vehicle is not necessary. But 55% of my daughter's generations, uh, Gen Z, said that they don't need to own a car. So um, looking in the future, more and more people could accept transportation without ownership. So this model is certainly worth looking at. Um, and who else is looking at it? A couple of the ones in the news recently. Trenton, uh, New Jersey, a city from I understand about 100,000 people is looking at uh, doing 100 autonomous vehicles in their program called Trenton Moves. They basically would have them accessible for their entire city. So they've started that process. Uh, and more, more close to home, Jacksonville is looking to implement 10 miles of autonomous vehicle shuttles. Uh, I think there's about 40 or 50 shuttles they're looking at in their program. So there's some pretty major cities that have started to look at this as a, a, a true possible future solution. Um, in, in Altamont Springs, uh, we actually started looking at an alternative transportation system 23 years ago. I love this slide because this is what we first envisioned. You'd be sitting at your computer with your old screen there and dialing up your, uh, your dial-up uh, modem, you know, and, and looking at the, uh, getting, your, getting your transit ride. So we did start studying this, and the, the whole, the whole uh, option there was to try to look at something that was more dynamic, um, more high-tech, to try to supplement some of the rides in the area. So more recently, we've been looking at the uh, 436 corridor, um, Altamont Springs. We have I-4 north-south, Sunrail north-south, and 436 east-west. And we're trying to look for a way to kind of supplement the existing transit systems in the east-west, especially north of 436, where our uh, Cranes Roost Park is. Uh, that's a, one of our uptown Altamont redevelopment areas. Um, you may have seen this uh, project that's about to be done in Altamont Springs. And um, if you try to, to use transit from there, uh, it's a 1.1 mile walk. Um, and so we're trying to find ways to supplement areas like this in Altamont that are being redeveloped with an additional system, you know, in addition to links or SunRail and cars. Um, so we were actually under design um, for a project to add a pedestrian bicycle path between the SunRail station and the Seminole Kaiba Trail. And when the idea of the autonomous shuttle came up, we stopped and said, let's look at ways that we can change our network to accommodate bicycle pedestrians and autonomous vehicles. And we came up with this idea of FlexPath, um, which was an idea to build facilities that could accommodate uh, the autonomous vehicle shuttle and pedestrians and bicycles where possible. So this is kind of a complicated map, but it shows where we have uh, areas where we're going to have uh, the ability to have uh, autonomous vehicles running in the same spaces as uh, micromobility, electric bikes, uh, scooters, and uh, higher speed bikes, but we're also providing uh, separate facilities for bison pedestrians who don't want to be, be on the road. So here's some renderings that, that BHB did for us of what this will look like on Central Parkway. Uh, we have a nine foot AV lane uh, that the vehicle will operate in. Uh, here's some other pictures. And we're also adding some pedestrian bicycle improvements uh, race crosswalking areas, trying to really create a lower speed environment for these shuttles. The autonomous vehicle pilot project itself um, will be a three-year um, pilot, and the goal is to really try to develop it over that three years as the technology continues to emerge and try to develop it. Year one will be very simple. That's in green. Year two expands to blue and year three to red. Eventually, by year three, it will go all the way from the Sunrail station back to uptown. Uh, and we're, we're using this as, as a learning experience. We want to see, can we continue to progress over these years? Can the technology progress? Can we get to a system that would be a useful local transit system, first mile, last mile system for the city? And we did receive a service development grant. I don't know why they got cut off at the top there. But service development grant from DOT uh, for three years, a matching grant. So we have that uh, starting uh, the fiscal year that starts July 1st.
Um, and then recently, we went through an RFP process. Thank, thankful to Eric and, and Jeremy Dilmore, who sat in the committee, and we selected BEEP, uh, who's located in Lake Nona. You may be familiar with BEEP. They're operating in Lake Nona, and this is their vehicle on the left in Lake Nona, and on the right, that's the vehicle they operate in uh, Peachtree City, Georgia. So uh, they are just selected, just approved on Tuesday night by our city commission. Uh, and that's the rendering of what they're proposing on the left, uh, the Navia vehicle. And then by year three, they're proposing to have a new vehicle that they're working with uh, Intel and Mobileye and Ventilaire, which is a German auto manufacturer, um, to put together uh, a very specific vehicle. So we're excited about that. So hopefully by year three, we'll see the technology on the right coming to Central Florida. And uh, some quick things about the, the overall goals. I won't go into detail everything, but of course safety. Uh, the advantages of autonomous vehicle technology are to potentially increase safety. Um, we're going to be doing a specific mobile application. We are proposing to integrate that into, you know, a lot of the other programs like Google Maps. So you'll be able to see our shuttle when you choose, uh, you know, wayfinding and, uh, you know, journey, journey trip selection. Um, of course, we want to produce a mode shift. We want to switch people's behavior. Uh, and we want to be able to, to exchange data with the AV shuttle and other infrastructure. Um, we talked about the, the Central Parkway. I showed you the renderings. We want to see, you know, can this be incorporated into a complete street standard? You know, this flexible lane concept, does that work? Uh, and by year three, we want to reach level four autonomy. Uh, currently, you have to have a safety driver. Uh, so that's part of year one and two. Uh, we want to see if by year three, if we can get to that point where we don't have a safety driver. Uh, BEEP has a, uh, a remote um, operating center in Lake Nona that they can control the vehicles remotely. And that's the goal, is to have no safety driver, but have someone that can take over the vehicle uh, remotely if needed. Uh, so that's our goal by the third year. And then, you know, with it being an FTOT grant and partnering with FTOT, uh, whatever we learn here, uh, we hope we can help to implement in other parts of the state. Um, and if this model uh, works, that's something we can replicate to other places, uh, other locations like, uh, like the city of Altamont. And uh, so just a little more detail on the, the plan. The first year is going to be from the Embassy Suites to um, the Bahama Breeze area. So it's a very short route to get the system up and going. The first year is going to be a lot about making sure it works, getting the information out to the public, kind of a proof of concept. By that second year, we're going to go around the mall and we cross Palm Springs Drive um, and get to the hospital. Uh, this is one we're going to, you know, uh, be developing that mobile app. Um, the first crossing with the traffic signal we'll be coordinating, and then the year three brings it to the full from the Sunrail Station to Uptown, uh, brings it on Central Parkway with that flex lane I talked about, and hopefully getting to that mature, fully operating local transit system. And there's just some things to show you, some, since we're a lot of techie people in here. We worked with the mall, and the mall had three lanes. Uh, we were able to work with them to convert the outer lane. Um, so we're going to have an outside that's going to run counterclockwise around the mall. I guess that's, yeah. Um, and um, it's going to, uh, to have an outside lane that's going to be for, for the shuttle only and people making right turns. And then we're, having, we're moving an existing pedestrian crossing on Palm Springs 250 feet to the south to connect to uh, the route for the AV. So the AV will have a specific signal that it can cross to go into the mall, which will only be for autonomous vehicles. And then on where we have autonomous vehicles on the main road, we have a conflict where we have a, a nine-foot lane and the through lane making right turns. So we'll have, we'll have specific transit signals uh, working um, at that signals as well, similar to what you see in Limon downtown, to allow a separate phase for the transit signal to turn or the shuttle to turn so it's not in conflict with through movements. As far as schedule goes, uh, the next couple of months, where we finalizing the contract with the vendor and getting the FDOT grant agreement, we expect probably February we'll be able to start operations. Um, we've still got a lot of discussions with some some issues with charging stations, charging areas, and that. So hopefully by February next year we'll start year one, uh, year two, 2024, year two, 2025, and then it would end in 2026. So. And then just to mention here, we got another project that we're looking at in the city. This would be our next AV project. We're working with the city of Maitland to try to get from Summerlin State College's campus through Advent Health's corporate headquarters by RDV and into the Maitland Center. So we've just started initial conversations with this um, project. 
and that's just a rendering one of our consultants did of possibly taking one of the lanes from, from Gateway Drive and converting it to a autonomous vehicle lane. With that, any questions? Shad? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I have yeah, multiple questions. Um, I guess on the third part, does on the shuttle, does it use the same road with both directions, or is there going to be a lane on both sides? Especially at the, um, the mall. The mall is, yeah, it only goes around one direction around the mall, so that will be a loop. So it will never, so, but on Central Parkway, it's in both directions. There are some very short sections that we have one way where it's going to have to coordinate to go through a small section, you know, so, and that's part of something we put in the RFP that it had to be able to work and notify. So we've got like a section that it goes from through Advent Hills parking lot into, um, I can't remember the name of the road there, right there. I just drew a blank where it, um, has to uh, has to go one way, so it's going to have to coordinate if there's two going opposite directions. The Navia know. seats up to twelve. Okay. Obviously, if COVID uh, situations, it was a lot less, but it seats up to twelve uh, okay. users. And so, and with you talking on the mobile app, so somebody will just pull it up, and it'll it'll you'll get a time frame of when it'll be there, or is it going to be continuously running already, or is it just on demand? The ones that 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 now will be part of the discussion. The ones we have now, the ones that I've seen, will show you the location it is and about where when it's going to come. So we don't know. We don't think it's going to be a fixed route like Links, where it says it's going to be here at ten twelve. It will be just running uh, continuously. But we're trying to get you know fifteen minute headways at the most. Um, but yeah, that's the mobile app. And then we have looked at is there a possibility for you know some type of dynamic stops where it only stops at certain places if it's called. And of course, we have to look at that and how that would work from different standards. It might have a, a loop that it goes to in the future only if serviced, you know. Uh, but we don't see it being like ride hell, where you're just going to stop somewhere and call it and you know hop on to the to yeah. the shuttle. It still will be set routes, but some of those routes may be dynamic and skipped if if there's no you know no calls. The um, on that the last one you showed there, which was interesting, is that like a sort of even a park and ride? Can somebody get to the first end and then they can just ride from there and it'll be parking at that, at the um, east end? Or what were you thinking on that? Is it just for? We had we had not thought about that, but that is an interesting question because, you know, the Seminole State College certainly could look at that option. So yeah, that's a, that's a, good, that's a good thought. We were looking at it as trying to connect, you know, Seminole State College has a lot of future plans. They own all of that property all the way to the south. It used to be, I think, Holler Chevrolet. Um, so we were looking at connecting the college with apartments, you know, businesses. Um, there's a, there's a, I don't know if this laser works or not. Can't really see it, but this, this property here is part of the Crescent Gateway DRI that is um, now owned by Advent Health, and they have plans to significantly redevelop that. Um, so we really were trying to connect a lot of land uses, but that's the possibility, you know, a partnership with Assembly State College to, to allow people to go there. But our, our thought was more of trying to capture these trips that are existing, that are, you know, are shorter car trips that are existing and try to capture them into a, uh, you know, a local network. Yeah, because I know a lot of people in there, they go to Gateway Crossings because there's like seven places in there to eat lunch. Yes. And it's very busy back and forth. So. Yeah, and that's part of what we, that I see an opportunity once you maybe, at least when you park for the day, you can go back and forth. And certainly with RDV here, that, uh, you know, provides some, some other trips that could happen. So. You know we're we're early on this one, but we certainly want to get you know get some champions. And as we're as we're talking to Advent Health about this redevelopment, we're already talking about how we can incorporate this in uh, to that. So, um, and as being an Altamont resident, and oh, you live in Altamont? I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Sure. Um, but also representing Longwood too. I mean, what was your thought of like ever expanding and how I, I'm sure there's a lot of parts but I just kind of curious about that and then working with the other agencies I don't know if you've already talked to Kelly or yeah I mean else, cer so. certainly this is you know if you look at what Trenton or Jacksonville is doing it's very expandable so this is a pilot so if it's successful we hope it's scalable and um, you know we have uh, we already have the, the uber partnership set up with five cities so um, that is a an ongoing interlocal agreement where we can partner pretty easily with other cities 
Um, so, so certainly if it was successful, um, at some point, I don't know how, you know, scalable it is to different areas, um, but we, you know, certainly that when we were, uh, I don't know if you were involved, Shad, but early, before the pandemic, we actually laid out, I think each city had kind of talked through what, what we would do if we could partner, and there were different routes that we had looked at in, in the different cities. Um, you know, and one of the obvious connections in Longwood is some, the Sunrail Station of the hospital. Um, yeah. So, you know, we had looked at some of those just kind of like high level throughout the corridor. You know, this one came up with Maitland. I know Maitland has, Maitland would love to try to connect over to the, to the Sunrail Station, but you have obviously some hurdles getting across I-4. So Sanford, I know, has talked about, you know, using Thomas Vehicles connections. They have their existing uh, trolley system. So there's, there's certainly, an, you can go up and down the corridor, probably everyone, every city that's here that has Sunrail Stations could probably find a use case, you know, yeah. to look at. So How are you going to? How are you going to advertise it to the residents and stuff like that and people yeah. to try to users? That will be, you know, Beep itself does a lot of marketing, you know, that's part of their, um, but we certainly will have a public involvement campaign. You know, the good news is that because it's at Cranes Roost Park, you know, um, we have a lot of events there, and so that's a good place to kind of showcase it, but we'll have, uh, we'll have that, um, you know, starting and ending at MC Suites is good too, that, you know, that location. Um, right by the park, so we'll have uh, we'll certainly have some public information starting ahead of ahead of that in the fall. Thank you. Shad's one of my favorite residents. I have to, <laughs> have to work for Shad. <laughs> <laughs> Doug. Doug, go ahead. Brett, I really like how you have your phases because you're kind of advancing the technology rather than just doing a pilot of here to there and show it works. I would encourage you along the way to record not only the technology, how you do it, but just the thinking process. How did you decide this was a good idea? How did you decide where to run? Because that is something that's usually not presented a lot, is how did you get down that path, along with the training of first responders, because they're not used to these vehicles. So by mm -hmm. recording that, that would be a great guide for the rest of us following along. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and our, for our, actually our police department was invited to participate in an exercise with Beep, um, where they went down there. And I know that Beep's worked closely with um, the city of Orlando, I know already, um, their first responders. So that is something, because obviously it's a different thing in the security concerns. Um, so yeah, we have, we have already started that process, but very good comments, Doug. Brian, <coughs> Thank was you. was Beep solicited directly, or was that a competitive process? It was a competitive process. Okay. Yeah. So we had, we we put out an RFP, and had it on the street, and um, so that was selected. Yeah, we had a selection committee and went through that process. How many other vendors applied? We actually only had one other vendor um, put in, but we had three or four that asked a lot of questions. Um, so we had interest level, but we only had two. A lot of them asked for kept asking for extensions, extensions, and so, you know, we. Uh, we finally cut it off, but we, you know, we did have interest from probably five or six vendors that asked questions, and a lot of them, once they heard about it, asked us to, to talk to them. Um, but there's probably really only like maybe five that do this out there, you know, five different vendors probably. With 15-minute headways, how many vehicles do you uh, anticipate in the first phase, and then, you know, what what's the what's the ultimate? Yeah, we expect the first phase two vehicles, second phase three, and, and fourth phase, or third phase four. Um, maybe it, maybe an additional vehicle um, for, you know, it depends. That, that was one of the things actually be put in their proposal. They want to talk to us about scheduling because they think they can save a vehicle in year two based on schedule. So that's one thing we'll have to balance. And, and Ryan and I went back and forth a lot, um, Ryan Fetchko here at VHB. Uh, how you schedule them because you, know, you have charging and stuff. So we're going to rely on the vendor too if we can save obviously a vehicle. But it looks like we'll be able to do it with definitely two the first year, but it might be four the second year and four the third year, depending on that. Um, depends on charging time and, and use time. So that, that becomes important. You know, they kind of nest. You know, if you go to Lake Nona, they don't operate. I think between maybe ten and four or something. Ten and three is kind of their charging nesting period, and they come back out. So we may have something similar in ours too. Where is your nesting location? We've been working with the Altamont Mall at the uh, Sounds right. at the parking garage south of the AMC is where we're proposing to have them. Be. And this is going to be a free service or the fare box? It'll be free. Free. Yeah. Except for Shad. 
Except for Shad. <laughs> Shad right. already pays for it, I guess. That was what I was <laughs> All right, thanks. Hey, Brett, uh, yeah. just wanted to ask, and I don't think you mentioned, what hours of operations and kind of is it seven days a week? Or are you targeting just kind of the weekday? We are doing seven days a week um, because, you know, the, the park and the mall are, are heavily used on the weekends. So we are doing that. But there will be, you know, periods in the middle of the day where it's not used and it will depend on the, the uh, you know, the years. As we go to the third year, we're trying to make, you know, we're, we're – the third year, we have commuters, we have hospital workers, you know, residents at apartments. So we were trying to figure out a system that works. So that that we put a tentative plan. But mostly, you know, in, in the beginning, it will be a retail operation. The first year, you know, you're looking at only serving really retail trips and uh, trips from, you know, some apartments. But then by the third year, it will hopefully get people to go from apartments to Sunrail or apartments to um, the hospital. So we'll be looking at more serving those commuters. But being a pilot, it's still going to have limited... Um, you know, the hospitals are 24-hour 24 24 operations, so we can't serve everyone at the hospital. But we were trying to figure out ways to still get people that work the typical shifts of the hospital uh, in the future. So I can't off the top of my head remember all the exact schedules, but that is something that we went back and forth on to try to, you know, balance that. Yeah. I won't pick um, on you anymore, Shit. Um, so, like, the year three, where you're at the Sunrail station, yeah. have you coordinated or talked to DOT about... I mean, then residents could park right there, yeah. and then ride the ride it all the way in to Cranes Roost and stuff, and reduce the traffic on 436. Which, yeah, I mean, we um, we haven't talked about that being a parking ride, but that is a good question too. Um, nothing, <laughs> no one's going to know if you park at the Sunrail Station, obviously, yeah. and use, and there's plenty of parking. Yeah. Uh, but that's a good question too. Uh, we we've certainly talked about that, but we have we're we will be using the transit you know areas of the Sunrail Station like any other transit vehicle. Um, but we had not talked about parking, so that's, that's a good question. You know, one of the things we would, would ask by our parks department is could that be used in the future to, you know, we have very large events at Eastmont Park. We have big baseball tournaments that have parking issues, and it's pretty close. So, you know, that's one of the things we looked at. Is there a way we can run special event shuttles from the Sunrail Station to, to there in the future? So um, we've talked about the park and ride issue, but just not in that context. But it's a good question. So Brett, very interesting and innovative presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. I just want to start with a comment. Sure. With no offense to Chad, having answered 200 questions for Chad this morning, <laughs> I think you're standing on Mount Ingenious. Not Mount. <laughs> uh, first thing is uh, the lane selection. I know you have utilized an existing lane uh, mm -hmm. in the mall. How you? How are you acquiring additional paths for this? Thing? Are you taking away from the? Travel lanes and making a special lane. Or? On Central Parkway, we had um, a little bit of both. So we had 12 foot and 14 foot lanes. That was the the standard when it was built. You know, they had the wide lane for bikes. So we actually get, went up with 10 an inside 10 foot lane, outside 11 foot lane, and then the 9 foot lane. Uh, and we did have to narrow the median a little bit to make that happen. But we're pretty much tr whenever possible, we're trying to hold the you know the existing curb line. But there still is quite a bit of reconstruction on Central Parkway. So that's that's year three, so there's there's a pair, there's two parallel projects. I didn't get into that too much, but there's an infrastructure project that's going happening, and then there's the operations project. So year one doesn't need any infrastructure, but we're actually uh, out to bid right now with the infrastructure improvements for for Central Parkway uh, and some of the other stuff. So the timing is that you know we'll have those infrastructure improvements done by the time we get to, to year three. But it, yeah, we had had a lot of visions over the years on Central Parkway. So we're using that as this is an opportunity to really redo Central Parkway, try to slow the speeds down. Kittleson uh, did a study for us, a very good study of looking at that section of Central Parkway. Uh, and, and, and so we're trying to slow speeds down, improve pedestrian safety, and also, you know, improve trail connectivity and accommodate the AV vehicle. So that's why it's, you know, it's kind of two projects in one. We're, we're doing, you know, you'll be able to have a, a much better pedestrian bicycle, east-west connections. People that come to Cranes Roost will have in safety improvements. So... This is something that we were already doing, and we modified it to, you know, Bruce was at VHB at the time, and I called him up and said, hey, Bruce, um, you've already, you know, you, you have this scope in for a, a trail project. Can, you, can we add an AV, you know, to it? So the project completely kind of changed at the, you know, at the early stages, and we, we ended up, uh, you know, incorporating the two into one project. And obviously, the goal is to reduce the amount of trips on the roadway. Do you have, like, metrics associated with this project in mind? 
We don't, and if someone else has some really good data on autonomous vehicles, um, you know, I do have some of the data on Beep, uh, what they're doing, and of course, you know, it is low compared to that. Um, we are obviously targeting those shorter trips, especially in the first couple of years. I don't expect a lot of mode shift by year one, but you're definitely two, years two and three, even though I say that with, that we don't, if you can ride from Embassy Suites to Whole Foods in the mall and to Bahama Breeze, I think actually that will be decently used. So, uh, and there's another apartment there um, by Whole Foods. So, you know, I think actually that could be used more than we think. But certainly, um, when I talked to DOT and got the service development grant, I was concerned. I said, what are your ridership expectations? Uh, and they did say they understood this is a technology project and that we were looking at more of technology than ridership. So we're not necessarily focusing that, hey, our goal is to hit X amount of people. Our goal is to see if, you know, this can, can really operate in these areas. You know, because if you look around where these are operating, this will be probably the most complex by year three that, you know, maybe some of the others are going to get there, but not many, you know, autonomous vehicle shuttles have gone on areas that are as complex as this. So that's really the goal is to see if you can even get it to work. And then, of course, you know, it's also important, do people use it? And part of this whole process is do people accept this technology, you know, just like, you know, we all told our kids growing up, don't get in a car with a stranger, and we now all get in cars with strangers, right? And um, so we accepted rideshare, we accepted riding Uber, and, you know, will people accept this? Um, that, that's part of the, the process, too. So. Excellent. Will there be any separation, physical separation, uh, of the uh, automated vehicle travel lane compared to the rest of the lanes? That's a, that's a good question. They actually, if you look at what Beep is doing in Peachtree City, Georgia, they have um, tubular delineators. So we did not propose that, and, and that actually came on discussions of, you know, Ryan um, talked to a lot of autonomous vehicle vendors, and they felt comfortable with the nine feet. Uh, but we have seen that in other places. So um, if there, if we feel like that's, there's certain areas where we're having the situation, we could try to put delineators. Um, they're not obviously not pretty. They don't necessarily go with our, uh, <laughs> our look in Crane's Roost. But that's something that I think we'll, we'll find out. You know, the vehicles, obviously, if they feel like there's side friction, they'll, they, they decelerate. You know, if you've ridden them at um, Lake Nona. So if we feel like they're not able to operate in that lane because of that issue, then that's something we may have to address. Um, so, you know, we have that nine feet, but we also have that curb pan, uh, which is about which is 18 inches. So we feel like there's enough space that the vehicle could operate and still have that buffer from the cars going next to it. But that's something that we'll, we'll find out. All right, thank you. And we did have, a, I think it was a, on the mall, uh, we did like similar to what you see in a buffered bike lane, kind of like a double stripe. So that we did have some, I think one, you know, an extra foot of striping to give a buffer there, and and um, so that we, you know, it's nine in the mall. It's actually a little wider lane because that was one of the concerns the mall had was, you know, that very issue. This question, Mike Woodward. Yeah, just remind the green line they're going to run the track. Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah, one, one of the things just to notice is that we're comfortable putting this on any roadway that's 25 miles an hour or less. So anytime that it's on a road, it's just driving, it's riding on the roadway. So um, we don't have any special lanes on any local roads. So it's only, it's only in areas that has, you know, higher speed limit or we feel like there's a, you know, interaction. The mall traffic was enough to circulate a road to have a separate lane, but like on Uptown Boulevard, those are all designed as low speed roads today, so we'll be riding on the road. Kelly? Uh, related to that, what was your anticipated operating speed? Is it 15? Or? Well, uh, that's a good question. We, we want to get closer to 25, and we put that in the RFP, so by year three, we had them submit, but the first year operations, they only anticipate, I think, an average of 12 miles an hour, uh, and then I think they progressed each year, but we, we really want them to get closer to 25, especially on Central Parkway. Uh, the speed limit, we're actually dropping the speed limit. It's 30, 30 in some sections and 35, and we're actually dropping it to 30. But we really think that, you know, that we, we want them to operate closer to that. But that's a big um, challenge right now with the technology. Um, they're not approved to operate at higher speeds because of, you know, the technology and the sensors and the safety. So um, they are very low speed, and that's one of the reasons they want to get the, um, the newer technology in there. Uh, and that's going to be crash tested. I think it's FMVSS. Um, 
Federal Motor Vehicle, Vehicle Safety Standards, I think is what it stands for, crash tested so that they can operate. In, and right now they have to get NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, waivers for all the uses, and that limits their speed. So you know, they realize that these, these shuttles, like the Navia shuttle, are limited, and they need to move towards that. The other, there's other autonomous vehicle providers that are, are using already approved, crash tested electric vehicles and converting them to autonomous vehicles. So there's both routes, and those can go faster, um, but they're being retrofitted um, into autonomous vehicles, and they still got a driver wheel and all that stuff. So these are like the Navia shuttle. If you've been to Lake Nona, it has no you know, no steering wheel. It's only <laughs> it's got the guy's got the uh, remote control. Question. Mike. <laughs> hey, uh, Mike Woodward with Kimley Horn, 189 South Orange. I'll give you the car. Um, compatibility with cyclists, right? So if there's a nine-foot lane, a dedicated lane, particularly on uh, Central Park, Central Parkway, um, and the speeds initially are 15 miles per hour, and there's only maybe f a few of them running at a time, it's going to be very inviting. You're going to have some cyclists. So my question is, I guess, do you anticipate cyclists? How many? And is that problematic, or is that, is that a perk? Um, so that is that is one of the challenges, and that's why we want to study it. And when I said like complete street standards, it's trying to look at that compatibility. Uh, there's there's different types of bicyclists, and there's only a certain amount of bicyclists that would want to ride on Central Parkway directly. We're going to have a 10 foot trail as part of our riding, so you'll have a nice 10 foot trail. And so the people that want to ride in Central Parkway would be someone that doesn't want to ride the same speed that people on the trail are going to ride. Um, so those are the, the, the Bruce Doigs of the world who, you know, are usually between 15 to 20 miles an hour when they're on their bike. Uh, but if I'm with my wife, she's going to be like, I'm not going to be, there's no way I'm going to be on there. And we're going to be on the, you know, the, the multi-use trail. So uh, the hope is that the people that decide to use the on-street bike lanes are higher speed bicyclists that are, you know, going to be closer to the compatible speed. But it will be a conflict in certain situations. Um, but at the same time, because of the headways, you, a bicyclist also has the opportunity to have a very nice wide <laughs> nine foot lane for a good part of the, the day. So, um, you know, that, that's something that we're looking at, that concept of, you know, can you share that vehicle? If you talk to the autonomous vehicle vendors, they don't want it. They want, they want that lane themselves. They don't want to share it with anyone else. So that will be kind of the challenge. Thank you. Get, is there like a record, Eric, for the most questions answered in a single <laughs> TISMO just, presentation? Just one question for me. <laughs> Oh, Getting great presentation, Brett. Uh, from a liability standpoint, is yeah. the city assuming any liability here, or is the vendor taking all liability in case of a crack? That we are making this a turnkey approach. Of course, you know we still have liability for our city, but we do, you know, we are basically turning that over to the vendor. And interesting in liability is that when when we worked with the different property owners. Um, we already had language in some of the developers' agreements that they had to participate in, in local transit systems, but you know the language was broad. So when we started negotiating the actual easements, um, you know there were a lot of concerns about that. So we actually um, have very high insurance standards, you know, in this project for that reason, and we have specific language for indemnification and liability with some of the um, property owners that it's operating across, especially the mall. So. That's certainly a question. You know, we got our risk manager involved pretty early in the process. She reviewed some insurance stuff, but it is it is on the, you know the vendor to to do that as a turnkey operation. So we even debated: do we want to hire our own safety attendants, and you know whether that was a good idea. But we in the end we decided that for a pilot, especially you know, hand it over to the vendor, and you know, and they're fully responsible. All right, great comments and discussion for the questions. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I just want to thank uh, the city of Altamont Springs uh, because I recall the flex bus study and uh, it was pretty much the same concept but different technology. And so over 20 years, the city of Altamont has remained steadfast in, in trying to figure out ways to get people out of cars. Uh, so again, thanks for the good work. We still got a lot of uh, a lot of hurdles on this one to, to go forward, so hopefully we'll uh, be able to report back here uh, in a couple of years. So thank you guys for the questions. Good discussions. Good recommendations. Thank you. And uh, if you have any further questions, uh, Brett, you'll catch them on the sun rail. <laughs> if you want to have any further questions on this uh, topic, could, could we but, get uh, this PowerPoint? 
email. Say again? Yeah. Can we get the, e the PowerPoint email out? Sure, I'm sure we. Email okay, yeah, we'll get it out. No responding to <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Appreciate that. All right, moving on to uh, actually common presentations. <clears throat> Meet us at the uh, TAC meeting. We'll have a presentation on the I-4 truck uh, and freight parking pd &E study, as well as a presentation on the FDOT target speeds. Move along on general information. You'll find uh, some information in tab four on uh, certain items there. One of the things to note is the Metro Plan, Metro Plan Board highlights for June 8th, 2022. I'm sorry, the, yeah, the June 8th, 2022 board meeting highlights and close for uh, information purposes. And then uh, down to the upcoming meetings of interest to TISMO members, we have the next MPO board meeting uh, here on July 27th at uh, 9 a.m. And then our next TISL meeting will be held here in person on August 26th at uh, 8.30. So we don't have a meeting um, in July. All right, so moving on to um, member comments. Do we have any uh, committee members wishing to uh, say any final comments? All right, hearing none. <clears throat> we'll move on to our second public comment uh, opportunity. If any members of the public wish to comment, please use the raise hands function and you'll be recognized. Or dial star nine on your phone keypad and we'll unmute, you, unmute your microphone. After you are recognized, please state your name and address for the record and limit your comment to two minutes or less. Do we have anyone joining us virtually that wishes to make a comment at this time? There are no hands raised on the virtual. Okay. We haven't received any other public comments for anyone attending in person? I did not receive any. All right. Well, before we adjourn, I uh, just wanted to say uh, uh, thank you for everyone's great uh, discussions and comments and questions today. Uh, another thing, too, is uh, next weekend is uh, Fourth of July weekend, so I just want to make sure that everyone has a nice, safe, relaxing, adventurous uh, Fourth of July weekend and um, down in Kissimmee we do have a our monumental 4th of July celebration uh, that Monday July 4th is uh, from 5 p.m. to uh, 5 to 9 p.m. and uh, we do have uh, plenty of music drinks food um, games going on um, I think sister Hazel is performing that night so um, followed by a our um, Fireworks does a presentation at uh, 9 p.m. and um, we'll have uh, uh, F-16 uh, flyover. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> I may send some uh, Cessnas or or, or uh, corporate jets from Kissimmee Airport over to fly over. But um, anyways, just want to make sure. Uh, wish everyone a happy uh, Fourth of July Independence Day. And if we have no other business, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you. Good job. Thank you.